This is my second video on early modern philosophy. Um, this one goes into Descartes, Malebranche, and Spinoza. René Descartes was the most important figure of early modern philosophy. He's the most influential uh, of these thinkers on later philosophy. He invented something called analytical geometry, which later came to be called geometrical algebra. <clears throat> And by means of it, he was able to solve many problems in mathematics that had gone unsolved by uh, traditional geometry going back to the ancient Greek times. So Descartes becomes enamored. He falls in love with this new mathematics and its possibilities, and he wants to apply these to philosophy. He has a doctrine of innate ideas, so he believes that certain ideas are inborn, um, that connects him back to Plato. Uh, he also has a doctrine of clear and distinct ideas uh, 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 as well as confused and indistinct ideas. So these come to us uh, by two different avenues. Um, our confused and indistinct ideas are stimulated by the senses. Our clear and distinct ideas uh, come to us by reason alone. That's what makes him a rationalist rather than an empiricist. Descartes predicates a, an absolute dualism between body and soul. So he talks about res extensa, that's extended being, the fact that we are in a body, and res cogitans, uh, thinking being, and that's the fact that we have consciousness, right? He separates those. Um, uh, he also uses a skeptical method. He's not a skeptic, but he uses a skeptical method to get back to the cogito ergo sum, the I think, therefore I am, that is the most basic truth that we can have. And he does that by asking himself, what can I doubt? And he says he can doubt his body, he can doubt the existence of the external world, but he can't doubt the existence of his consciousness. Um, he knows that he is thinking whatever else is true. Um, so he thinks of the soul, the human soul, as thinking substance, res cogitans. He thinks of God as a clear and distinct idea. Um, and he thinks of God as the cause of the clear and distinct idea of God in the human mind. Um, he also briefly uses St. Anselm's uh, early medieval ontological proof for God's existence. Logical laws, he thinks, are also innate ideas. They're clear and distinctly known, as are mathematical axioms and uh, the idea of the extendedness of matter. The fact that matter takes up space is an innate idea. Now, the fact that Descartes had this mind-body dualism, this absolute separation between mind and body, meant that he had to explain how mind and matter influence one another. And he posited the pineal gland in the brain uh, as the only part of the brain that's not bilateral, right? Um, so it's not separated into, into two parts. Um, but the explanation is kind of silly. The solution to the problem is kind of silly because you can't explain the mind-matter connection just by talking about a piece of matter, something, some piece of the brain. Okay, um, so we're still we still have issues with this mind matter connection. So Malebranche, influenced by Descartes, goes to work on the problem of this matter mind connection, and he proposes something called occasionalism. Occasionalism says there is no real connection between mind and matter. What happens is that God, at every moment, supernaturally causes our minds to mirror what's going on in the physical world. Even the way that our mind works is controlled by God and has no necessary connection with the physical world. And Malbranche thinks of us as part of divine spirit. So in a way, Malbranche sees us as continuous with or as a part of God's mind. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's pretty close. 
you're going to want to want you're going to want to watch for a similar move in Hegel, where for him there's not going to be a real distinction in the end between consciousness, human consciousness, and God. But for now, we have to move from Malbranche to Spinoza. Spinoza wants to do ethics geometrically. Um, God, which he identifies with nature, gets him in a lot of trouble because he's then called an atheist. Uh, but he, he sees God and nature as coextensive with one another. God and nature are the same thing for him. And time is not a reality for Spinoza. It's just a way of thinking. And for Spinoza, we should always try to think timelessly. Causality, cause and effect, for Spinoza, only exists between uh, 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 things in the physical world, objects in the physical world, or between ideas or experiences in the psychological world, in the mind, in consciousness, there is no possible connection for Spinoza between the world of matter and the world of mind. They must be parallel, right? So uh, uh, Spinoza uh, uh, this is later called psychophysical parallelism, to contrast it with occasionalism, because occasionalism says on every occasion, this is Montbranche, on every occasion, God miraculously makes it such that my mind, my consciousness, mirrors physical external reality. Whereas for Spinoza, who does believe in God in his own way, he's not an atheist, but Spinoza believes that God set things up in the beginning so that mind, the world of mind, would parallel the world of matter. And that means that God does not have to intervene miraculously at every moment in order to see to it that the parallelism between mind and matter is preserved. Spinoza wants us to try to think timelessly so that this parallelism is preserved. I know I didn't quite under quite explain that concept in a way that you could understand it. Maybe there you should look at Spinoza's own writings or if you need to at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy online. Spinoza is a bit like uh, uh, Montbranche in the sense that for Spinoza, the human being is a mode of God's existence, not something separate from God's existence. So Spinoza is a monist. There is one and only one substance in the universe, and that substance is God or nature, and we are what he calls a mode of it, which you might say roughly is a, um, uh, an expression, right? or a particular way of being of that one substance. So a monist is someone who believes that there is a single substance. Spinoza is the first philosopher to develop a really full-blown theory of self-consciousness. It's implicit in Descartes, but it's not spelled out. And Spinoza talks about self-consciousness as the representation of a representation. That sounds a little confusing, but we get that representation of a representation, which is self-consciousness, by separating out the variable parts of consciousness from the invariable parts of consciousness. We'll see this idea coming back in Kant's own theory of self-consciousness. For Spinoza, the will and the intellect are the same. Both of them are manifestations of the drive for self-preservation in all substance. So I said will and intellect are the same for Spinoza. But Spinoza claims there is no such thing as free will because will simply operates by the laws that God builds into it. So the will is not free. The human will is not free. So that's the end of this uh, second video. 
The third video is on Leibniz and Wolf.